in here, which specifies a list of DLLs, which will be loaded into pretty much every process in Windows, particularly the ones that have GUI interfaces. Um, there's a DLL here called User32. Anytime anything links against User32, one of the first processes of User32.dll is to go out to this app in it DLLs and then also load up everything in there. There are legitimate uses for this thing. Um, you might want custom DLLs to be loaded into every process. For example, PGP Desktop, if you have that, PGP Desktop uses this legitimately because it wants to hook the behavior of certain Windows applications like um, Outlook Express or something like that. So whenever you send an Outlook message, PGP Desktop is loaded into memory, has code running to hook that certain behavior and encrypt your messages. So it uses the load library mechanism whenever it loads all these appendant DLLs. And the load library mechanism calls DLL main in every library it loads. So if I put malicious functionality in DLL main and I put it in appendant DLLs, I'm going to inject code into every single running process that links against user32, which is the vast majority of them. User32, by the way, it contains a lot of code in the Windows API relating to displaying graphics on the screen in Windows widgets and things like that. So any, pretty much any GUI is going to have it. Um, both of these are actually shown in auto runs from sys internals. Pretty much everyone in, in here has probably used auto runs. But still, the vast majority of people that use auto runs have no idea what those columns mean. I mean, they're just app init, DLLs, whatever, you know, image file execution options. I have no idea. So even though they're shown in there, if you don't honestly know how they're used, you might not honestly know how this can be used for evil. So it's still a valid technique, I believe. OK, now we're getting extremely lame. I'm sorry, we'll get a lot better here in a second. Um, process camouflage is just my just just the name I gave to um, clever naming and placement of your executable. Um, the most common processes you see running on Windows are like SVC host. Whoop. I just ran out of power. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, did not expect that. <laughs> okay, I can talk while I'm getting out power. Um, so the most common processes you see running on Windows are the um, SVC host process and the spool SV. SVC host is the service host control process. So every Windows service it runs gets run as the SVC host process. And the spool SV process is the print spooler. So there's usually multiple copies of each. Um, so since there's multiple copies of each, if I have a malicious process running as that name, you know, uh, on Average incident responder or network administrator or computer sysadmin might sit on there and he's, he'll see six or seven SVC host process running and he might not know what to do. Let me unplug this for a second. So basically we can just name processes. If we don't name them directly SVC host, we can name them other things um, because there can only be one process in C colon backslash Windows backslash system 32 with the name SVC host.exe. So if I wanted to hide my executable in that directory, I can't name it that, um, unless I trojanize it or something, but we'll get to that later. So I can name it something similar that maybe looks the same. I can name it um, spool svc.exe or svc host with a zero instead of an O, um, and it'll accomplish the same functionality because it'll look basically the same. Also, some tools such as um, this is really annoying. <laughs> Some tools such as a process monitor from Sys Internals, it, it has problems showing um, Unicode file names. So if I have a process with a Unicode file name, it'll actually, Sys Internals process monitor will actually show it as the process name above it. So it'll just duplicate that. So if the process I ran just before that is Notepad and then I run my malicious executable and it's named with a Unicode file name, it'll just show two instances of Notepad running in its list. It's just an obscure bug. But uh, it's still very valid. I apologize. After this, okay, that's really the basic easy stuff. Um, after this, we're going to start talking about, oh, yay. <laughs> Anybody seen that happen before? <laughs> okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about executing code from memory. This is kind of the more slick and uh, slick and dirty uh, way to get anti-forensics. Basically, if an incident responder shows up and he does, does nothing but image the hard drive, and there's no you know, executable payload on that hard drive that will give him indicators of that compromise or tell him what the hacker did, it's kind of hosed. And actually, 
it's pretty frightening, but a lot of incident responders out there, they, that's really all they do. They'll show up um, and just power down the box and take an image of the hard drive and never bother to capture memory or even take a look at the running state of the system. So if I had code that I executed only from memory, I could have pulled that down from the web or anything like that, run it, and I'm good to go. Here's basically an illustration of that. So I have the internet, which you know, it came out looking too well up there, but I have internet, I download code into my malicious process. So I still need a malicious process on that system that can go out and download this and run it. There's other tools out there. I know um, the Meterpreter and things like that. Um, but I'm, there's lots of talks about those, so I'm actually not going to cover that. I'm going to talk about everything else. Um, so this, the code we download, um, it doesn't have to be x86 shell code or executables. It can also be simple things like interpreted code. So my malicious process can be nothing more than a Perl script, which you know pulls something down from a network socket and just executes it. Um, most interpreted languages provide a facility to do, to do that, just execute data from a string or memory buffer or something like that. Um, but then if I have a Wireshark session and I'm able to capture that traffic, it's pretty easy to reverse engineer that executable at that point. I know, well, I see Perl code coming across the wire. I know that's probably a Perl interpreter, and here's the actual payload of that executable. Here's exactly what that hacker did to that system just based off of this. Uh, it's a little more complicated if I have something like a bytecode compiled language, and a lot of uh, programming languages provide that. So I basically I'm pulling down bytecode, and this malicious process is just interpreting this bytecode. So even reverse engineering of the malicious um, program on disk is going to be a little bit more tricky because it's not reading in ASCII strings and things like that and comparing. It's just using this kind of very obscure thing. There's actually a um, on Open RCE right now. I think still the, the number one article on there. The, the latest article was uh, a guy who went through and uh, unpacked this binary. It was just a, a test hyper unpack me too, and it actually did something like this. It was its own um, virtual language, and it. Uh, so he has had to reverse engineer the virtual language in order to figure out what the actual program did. Uh, it, but it, it turned out to be just kind of a cheap x86 knockoff, which I'll get to that in a minute. You know, if you're going to go through all that trouble, why just make it a cheap x86 knockoff? Why don't you go crazy on it? This thing, this thing we pulled down could also be executables, and that's really what I'm going to talk about now. Because uh, the process of ex executing a full executable file directly from memory is a bit of a challenge. Normally when processes execute, they actually require a file on disk to spawn that process. I already covered most of that. Um, well, actually, we need to go back here to Malvium. Um, so I mentioned there's like that hyper unpacking is just a cheap knockoff of x86. I'm going to have a little snippet of code coming out. I actually was hoping to have it out by now, but didn't quite get to it because uh, I have a product over there. My Graven's given up. They're actually paying me to develop. So that kind of came first before this free stuff that nobody is paying me at all. Um, got to make that money. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's a slightly more sophisticated x86. Uh, it has a forward moving stack as opposed to your regular backward growing one. So right off the bat, a lot of reverse engineers might be a little skittish of it. And a lot of automated like disassembly tools might be kind of freaked out. Some of them you can have plugins where you can add new architectures like IDA. But still, if you really screw things around with the stack, it might be kind of crazy. The main thing here being an extensible instruction set. If I can reprogram an instruction set on the fly, um, it's really tricky to make a debugger. I mean, a, uh, a disassembler. And I haven't really seen anything do that. So I, it's not an extremely you know, well-crafted extensible instruction set, but even the basics right now I think is pretty good. Uh, I have reverse engineered code that even just really easily switches between a couple different processors, like hard-coded processors, like ARM processors. It jumps between ARM and thumb. And even that can be a bit of a pain in the butt. So if I can extend the instruction set and basically have a new architecture every you know, 50 bytes or so, I can really uh, have fun with you. And I have low-level um, commands for load library and git proc address, which I implemented in the nice shell code way. So it's not actually calling load library and git proc address. It's a little more sneaky. Anyway, you can check my website eventually for that. Uh, Retargetable C compilers. So if I write all this malware in something like a, a new virtual machine, you know, I don't want to have to sit there and craft line after line after line of all this assembly code in my own crazy assembly language. I want to be able to write C code, and, or maybe take C code I already have. So you can take a retargetable C compiler. Most really big C compilers have a way that you can actually program them for new architectures. That's how they add new support. So I can just take GCC and then add a new like target definition file for it for my new virtual language and get basic C code to compile. Not the really complicated stuff and certainly no linking, but basic snippets of code I can get to actually compile in a, to a new architecture. 
Of course, writing those new um, definition files, especially for GCC, is a bit of a nightmare. There's easier ones out there, smaller C compilers that are much easier to understand. They, you can just do it through an API. You don't have to edit this intermediate language they provide. Okay, so I'm back on to executing code from memory. Uh, it's really kind of the pure, pure anti-forensics for disk forensics. That your malicious executable has never hit disk if you've done this right. Uh, Gary Nebit, uh, who's published that book, uh, the Windows 2000 intern, he basically went through and documented all these internal functions. Anyway, um, in response to a Usenet post, somebody was asking, I have a memory buffer with an executable, how do I execute it? And after a few tries, he came back with a technique. And it's actually pretty frightening for computer forensics. I hope it doesn't get out, but now I'm giving it out, so oh well. Uh, here's the basic abstract of it. It's certainly more complicated. I've whittled it down and highlighted the important parts. What we're doing here is creating a suspended process. So I can create a process and have it just stopped where it started. It never really got a chance to do what it did. Um, it's sitting at the entry point. Uh, and this particular process, if I can see here, is CMD. So this is the Windows command shell. I actually go through this here, but you can, I'll just talk through it. It's in the slides. Uh, ZW unmap view of section. This will basically, so the first thing I do, I have this, I'm stopped at the beginning. I'm just going to take all the code I have and just get rid of it. I don't care. I'm not going to need that code. I'll just get rid of it. So I unmap that stuff from memory. I virtual alloc X my new memory. So I have this code from a memory buffer. I'm going to allocate new memory in this suspended process. Uh, then I'm going to write my new uh, memory in there. If you notice, I, I write memory, I only write the headers first. Then later on, we go through and we write each of the sections. That's because sections, when they get loaded into memory, actually get put into different places than they are in the executable file. So they get kind of shift back. And so you can't just write the entire executable into one chunk of memory. It's not going to work. And then later on, after we've set up the context and everything like that, we eventually just resume thread, uh, as long as we're pointing back at the entry point. And everything should be good at that point. It's fairly frightening. Uh, additional benefits of this, I've basically done that process injection technique we did with like direct injection. So any code I inject into here is still going to be the CMD process. It's still going to have the privileges of the CMD process. It's going to appear to an incident responder as CMD. It's going to appear to, you know, process monitor and all these different things as CMD. It is CMD as far as anyone's concerned. Mainly bypassing host based firewalls. So after that, it kind of raises the question, well, wouldn't it be cool to do that under Unix? It's actually much more tricky under Unix because Unix doesn't provide us these nice convenient APIs for uh, manipulating remote processes and injecting code like Windows was so kind to do. I wish they did, but you know, I guess more security guys in Unix or something back in the day. Um, so the first couple techniques I'm going to talk about are actually developed by the Gruck. Very interesting reading. Um, I don't really understand why it didn't really get more traction. but uh, And then one new technique I've actually developed, which uh, can be used for some other purposes, is a little bit beyond what the, the Gruck had. It's just a different approach, though. Um, just like with Windows injection, there was like three different techniques that pretty much all do the same thing. I don't really see the harm in having other techniques to accomplish this same thing under Unix. So uh, the first one... Basically, the problem is uh, in Unix, Unix operates differently. I can actually slip to the next slide. Here's the, the difference in process invocation under Windows as opposed to under Unix. Under Windows, it does create process, and that does everything. That spawns my new process. I don't have to worry about it. It's all in one nice, nice neat little package. Unix, you have to use fork and exec in combination. So fork makes a copy of the current process, and then exec replaces that with the current. With